You're locked on to Prince George's Rock Station 94X, the station that is bringing you The Cult this Friday uh, down at the CN Center. Going to be an awesome show. Really looking forward to it. Uh, it's been a long time since we've had a band of this magnitude coming to Prince George, so we're all pretty excited about it. Right now, I have the lead singer of The Cult, Mr. Ian Asbury, on the line with me today. Hey, Ian, how's it going today, man? Good, good. Right on, right on. Now, you're down in Vancouver getting ready to play the uh, Orpheum. Uh, first of all, one of the things I actually wanted to ask you about, uh, I've read in quite a few of the interviews about uh, your love of British Columbia and Canada up here, and even more specifically Vancouver, where you recorded uh, Sonic Temple back in about 1988 or so. Uh, what would you say it is about Canada that impresses you so much? I think ultimately uh, it's the quality of the people. Right. Or the character of the people. Um, Canadians just seem to be a little bit more aware <laughs> of uh, of the surroundings and you know world affairs and um, generally friendlier. Right. And warmer, and uh, once you cross that border, a lot of tension. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah, away. and being in a place like Vancouver, which is one of the most beautiful beautiful cities in the world, um, the mountains and the, the the super nature of Canada. Right. Yeah. And I think the integrity of, of Canadians. Canadians have great integrity, and um, you know, I love a Canadian woman as well. Girl from Calgary, and uh, yeah, Paula. <laughs> so, um, so I have a lot of love for Canada. And I've spent extended periods here, and. Um, yeah, that's what Canada means a lot to me. Just before you and Billy Duffy decided to record uh, Born Into This, uh, you were part of actually a very extensive world tour with uh, Ray Manzarek and uh, Robbie Krieger of The Doors. Now, I know that The Doors were a pretty huge influence in your music, as you have said many times before, but uh, what was it like for you to get out there and honor what Jim Morrison and The Doors did for music, and what made you end that tour when you did? Well, being asked to do it was an incredible honor. I was the first person to um, perform that body of work in that context in 30, over 30 years, so that was pretty monumental you know and I played I did about 150 shows with Ray and Robbie right which is nearly as many as Morrison did one of the reasons I think the main reason that I had to walk away from it was that I devoted so much time and energy to the to the doors and to the doors legacy that I wasn't really taking care of my own legacy and my own creativity so um, I felt it was really important for me to you know to get back to work with what I know best and uh, certainly playing with the cult is a major part of that making this record born into this is been one of the most fulfilling experiences for me as a writer you know Holy Mountain is the pinnacle song of this album right um, you know this is a song about my relationship but it's a song a lot about a lot more than that it's about um, stripping away the wreckage of the past and arriving at this very high point in my life and it's a lot to do with <clears throat> with the woman in my life and Canada plays into it as well and so um, the the fact that we're actually playing um, this material is very poignant to me, you know, and it's um, it's very powerful right now. It's it's very real, and um, you know, we're not we're not going to come up there and just kind of like rock out nostalgia set. I have no interest in that. Right. Um, bring everything we've got. The band's not known for commercial success in the in the late eighties and the early nineties. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of the artistic work that I'm most proud of certainly Holy Mountain ranks probably the highest for me as a song right um, so in in essence you know I'm, I'm doing the best work of my life right now right and uh, we uh, as as music lovers people that are true lovers of music you know that uh, what the critics say about your music and uh, uh, what their take is on it doesn't always reflect uh, just how good and how great the uh, artistic measure of a lot of the stuff is out there so uh, yeah. absolutely I'm right with you now um, you guys uh, the cult of course has never really been all that popular with uh, music critics in the past out there uh, yeah. even though you guys have let a huge following of fans over your almost 30 years of rock out there uh, but looking at a lot of the reviews on the new album out there it almost seems like you guys have silenced them a little bit with born into this getting pretty good reviews uh, you guys even landed the album of the month honors uh, with the well-respected mojo music magazine as well how do you feel that this album matches up uh, towards what you've done in the past would you say this is the next level for you well i think it's just a case of to me having a success is that you're, you're in your truth and if you can get close to it's close to your truth as much of that on, on a recording as possible, then that's success. Um, you know, we tend to judge things commercially by the commercial sales. Right. By its popularity. But, I mean, McDonald's hamburgers are popular. You know, so <laughs> um, what's always popular isn't necessarily great art. Right, yeah. Um, you know, the critical acclaim that we've received from this album has been begrudging because a lot of people just can't work me out. In a lot of ways, the transition between 
you know, the other records and where we're at now is that we've, we're growing up. You know, I've grown up. Right on, yeah, yeah. And that's the whole thing, and it's it's really is uh, an honest, you know, uh, an honest portrayal of where I'm at right now in my life and what's going on for me. Right, yeah. Um, so for me, this album's an incredible success. And, and again, you know, Mojo, the critics at Mojo begrudgingly <laughs> give us <laughs> our dues because again it's like you know we're an anomaly in a lot of ways people can't work out the cult i mean the cult we've tr we've been through so many different sort of musical genres and yeah but they're different different times of a growth you know of a, of a cycle growing up and um so uh it's it's a lifetime Right. Now, uh, the cult, uh, you guys used to have a reputation of uh, being pretty rowdy, even a little bit destructive uh, during some of your early tours, including what I read today. You guys wrecked $30,000 worth of equipment through about three quarters of a tour back in 1987 going down to Australia. Is that true? Well, I was actually in, in th about three and a half minutes. <laughs> what did you do? I think it was just implosion. I think it was just a case that we've been out on the road for so long. Yeah. And we were kids. And right. We didn't have the skills, the cognitive skills, to be able to just say to our managers, "Please stop this tour. Allow us to go home and rest." We were just exhausted, yeah, and frustrated, and I mean, and just didn't know how to voice, you know, our needs. Right. So it was just, you know, we imploded on ourselves, and um, people love a train wreck. <laughs> They do. So they does do. the they media. Find it really yeah. fascinating. But on the inside of that train wreck is really a person struggling to find some serenity, you know, a bit of peace. And um, right, you put the kids through uh, that meat grinder touring. I mean, what I toured through most of my twenties, we were out going out for like just so so long extended periods. I mean, now for me, it's like three weeks is a is a is a stretch for me. Right, yeah. Where you guys used to do a year, two years at a time, right? Yeah, I like to take, I mean, I really prefer to do shorter runs and, um, you know, more focused, more. And, but I think there's a freshness within that um, that you retain and, and uh, you know, you can go away and rejuvenate yourself so when you come back, the performances are fresh again. Right. <laughs> Now, all the way through, uh, as, as we've said a few times in the interview already, you've had a huge fan base coming out to your shows. Uh, what would you say is one of your favorite fan stories that you have so far over the years? Fan stories. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, we have a lot of... We have a lot of uh, you know characters that, that uh, follow the band around. Um, right, yeah. People that travel from all over the world to see us perform. Um, that are really like very devoted that have tattoos of the band on their bodies and uh, are constantly present and you know usually at the front of the stage yeah um, one thing I will say is uh, maybe that something sticks in my mind that's that's we've been talking about the reviews and um, perception let's say perception of the band right is that it's always frustrating to do print interviews to find your words twisted twisted or added to right yeah and um and and then major things left out you know omissions that so that the piece flows a certain way right yeah um that's something that i'm really thinking about a lot right now because especially with my desire especially with what's happening in tibet um, which is something very near, near and dear to me. Right, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm now in a place where I'm starting to make more statements about this in the media and from the stage. And, uh, <clears throat> again, it's like, you know, a lot of people really think it's some sort of uh, esoteric or crackpot stance. But um, it's something I really want to be heard, would, li would, would like to be heard on right and um, have some insight into as I've traveled into that region and um, what I'm trying to write, do right now is to uh, get people um, encourage people to, to get a Tibetan flag and place it in their windows or to you know to make the, the Tibetan flag the new international symbol for the um, the disenchanted right everywhere and um, you know maybe we can start that tradition here in the in the in the you know in the pacific no northwest and um carry that through because the Tibetan flag actually has a sun on it very much like the british columbia flag right right yeah with the mountain and the sun so it's very it's really interesting it actually looks like the british 
Columbia flag a little bit. Right. Those elements are, are in it, and that's something I'm trying to encourage people to do. So, um, Is that something you do on a, on a night-to-night basis with your shows out there? Well, right now, it's just something that's happened recently uh, over the past week or so since the situation's been occurring. And right. I mean, I've always espoused to, you know, Buddhist views, and um, obviously much more so in the 90s as my practice grew and my awareness of myself grew. Yeah. <clears throat> but now in the precarious times that we find ourselves in, there seems to be no real connecting thread to a lot of the culture. And Tibetan culture, one of the major parts of it is the arts, the music, the mm-hmm. performance, yeah. poetry. Yeah. It's connected to the spiritual. And I think that's something we haven't had in music or the arts for I can't remember since the last time, you know, perhaps there's been pockets of it, but uh, the last time it was very powerful was in the 60s. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, people are still, still mesmerized by that energy and, and trying to reinterpret it, whether it's things like, um, you know, the Beatles love show at, at Las Vegas or, uh, you know, across the universe, the Julie Taymor film or, right. or, you know, the Doors, um, Morrison dug up every three or four three, five, six months on the cover of a magazine or, yeah. you know, Led Zeppelin reforming. Um, and some, you know, the political stances, a lot of the human rights stuff and um, the, the politicians are now sort of, you know, proselytizing about. Right. Um, so it's like, get you know, I, I don't know about getting it kick-started, but just drawing that kind of um, comparison. Right. And um, the cult, I mean, this album... You know, Holy Mountain to go to go back to that album was, um, you know, is the pinnacle of the record, and that really came about in Everest. I was in the Everest region with Apollo, my girlfriend, and uh, okay, yeah, and we traveled there. She took me there, and then and then everything sort of come down from that period. You know, so this period in my life, everything began at Everest. Right, and right. Uh- so you guys have uh, actually that's it's interesting actually that uh, you uh, take such um, what's the word you take such uh, stock in uh, the extra cultural affairs out there. I think that's one thing that's really been missing in music lately, and the industry is hurting. And that might might even be a piece of it. More people are worried about the money, and they're not worried about the art. And do you think that's exactly. one of the reason why it's in Absolutely. such a bad state? Yeah, it's coming about an external experience. I mean, the people that are crying so much are the people that own. The banks, I guess, the record labels. Exactly, yeah. But they haven't nurtured the heart. And But the heart can be healed. Yeah. There's the good news. Yeah. You, all you have to do is, like, this moment that we're in right now will be a past moment, you know? So everything you do right now is an investment into the future. I know uh, you have that. You know, if I'm in a record label right now, I mean, I've had this conversation with many people. Yeah. You know, they're talking about new models, business models, formats. La da 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 da, and I'm saying to them, I say, well, why not invest in creativity? Why not? How much money does it cost to find young songwriters and give them the tools to write songs? Very little to none. You know, put them in the studio, find, create studio environments, build right. studio environments, put young people in it, connect them up with other artists, encourage, you know, put the the energy into the creative process, right, and ask artists to go inside themselves and come out with the stuff and then work out a way of, you know, getting it to the general public where everybody is best served. I mean, I think the idea of, you know, guys on record company labels that have got like, you know, some some have got seven-figure contracts. Yeah. Which is outrageous. For, for doing what? Yeah, exactly. For administering a, um, a company. Yeah. But certainly not, you know, um, I really admire the... Um, I think it's what's his name, um, the gentleman that that t- became the head of Sony, um, a Welshman. I've forgotten his name. It slipped my mind. Uh, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head either, but I do know who you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, he basically came in there and said, "You know what? Um, we make all these products. Give me one iPod." Right. Oh, so Mark Granger, I think his name is. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, and you know, and he said, "Give me one good, give me one good product," and. Um, Let's stop messing about with all this, you know, trying to trying to fit the marketplace. Right. Why not go in and just do something original? Exactly, yeah. And the best music really seems to be coming out of people's bedrooms. 
It does. And uh, uh, that's that's a cool little uh, angle right now as well is uh, the technology is allowing people to be able to do stuff like that on their own. And uh, with a little bit of smarts, you can market yourself out there as well, which is a it's a great side of things uh, from from the uh, music record company side. It's cool that we can get away from them a little bit and uh, produce our own stuff at home. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you come from, where you live. I mean, you've got great resources available to you. Yeah. So I'm all for home publishing and home creativity. Right. Um, what seems to happen, though, is that, um, you know, we get these portals that people go to for to see how things are being reviewed. You know, as humans, we always want to know if it's okay yeah. to like something. Exactly, a lot of things yeah. that I like, a lot of people just aren't really interested in. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, before our show, we usually play like music that is the more the kind of music that I like personally. Right. What What do you listen to? Well, I listen to a wide range of music. I mean, I listen to anything from um, soundtracks of um, films that I love. For example, I just downloaded the uh, soundtrack to Kundun by Philip Glass. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I thought that Twenty Three, the Blonde Redhead album last year, was an incredible record. It was, it was greatly overlooked. Right. I think In Rainbows is a great record. From Radiohead, yeah. Yeah, um, I love Justice. I think uh, everything from Ed Banger Records, Busy P, Fez, I love all of that. Right. Um, Uncle, U-N-K-L-E, War Stories album, which I've got two tracks on. Yeah, yeah. Um, Burn My Shadow and When Things Explode. Um, you know, just to name but a few. The last Primal Screen record that came out, I thought was a great record. It was a good album, yeah. So um, you have a very wide range. Then you're not you're not a, a, a strict rock guy or anything like that. You have a very no. wide, wide range of music. That well, you like to rock to. music. I mean, it's it's interesting because you can go in, you know, go through periods of like loving. I mean, like right now, for example, Led Zeppelin. Listening to Led Zeppelin and having not listened to Led Zeppelin for many years, it sounds so fresh. Yeah, yeah, and. um it's great to revisit that and listening to the Beatles again, late period Beatles, mm -hmm. White Album, Abbey Road, um, you know, uh, Let It Be. Those records, the later period Beatles records, are magnificent. Absolutely. And to listen to them again is just like shocking, shocking. Yeah. You know, Stones, Exile on Main Street, you hear that again, it's fresh. The Doors, I mean, the Doors sound so futuristic. They do, yeah. Yeah, they always did, yeah. Joy Division, I adore. I mean, Dirty Little Rockstar, for example, is a cross. To me, it's like a hybrid between Joy Division and the Rolling Stones, that song. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I can see that connection, yeah. And the bass line is kind of like um, influenced by Joy Division, and the, the guitars are definitely Stonesy. So very much so, yeah, yeah. Okay, well let's uh, let's get into that a little bit as well. You got a big show coming here uh, yes, in sir. Prince George this Friday. Uh, the fans have been uh, excited about this for a very long <clears throat> excuse me a very long time. Ever since we announced the show, uh, the phone lines have been absolutely insane. So what can we expect from the show? We talked about this a little bit earlier, but good mix of new and old, uh, yeah, smashing of guitars, maybe. No smashing of guitars. <laughs> I tell you, I don't. Think Billy would smash any of the guitars? They're too expensive. <laughs> they are, yeah. <laughs> um, but I know that he has a signature model coming out at some point, so that would be interesting for people to look forward to. Oh, right on, yeah, yeah, yeah and rightly so. The um, uh, thing now for me is um, get on stage. Is I just drop into the zone of the songs, and I'm more about singing, right, than running around the stage. I'm really present in the singing, right, I'm really right, very focused in that, and. Uh, you know the um, the performance is is really important. I mean, it's the, it's the, it's the pinnacle of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, in a lot of ways. I mean, that's why we're here is to perform these songs, and we, we'll play a blend of songs. I mean, we're playing stuff from as far back as Death Cult. Right. Okay. That yeah. That sounds fresh. Like last night in Seattle, we played a set that included Spirit Walker, Horse Nation, Rise, She Sells Sanctuary, um, Dirty Little Rockstar, Savages, Assassin, Illuminated from the new album. We right. played. Um, we played Rain, we played um, played Wildflower, we played uh, Firewoman, um, Sweet Soul Sister, you know, a real mix of... It is a killer mix. You know, yeah. we've, we've been rehearsing things like Gone from the 95 album. So it's basically, this is this is a, a full coverage of the cult from start to finish type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, uh, we're really looking forward to the show. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time you did with us today, and uh, can't wait to see the big show on Friday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care.